the top five budget Yu-Gi-Oh decks this format. Big dog, I know that Yu-Gi-Oh has been seen as a very expensive game, but today we're gonna be talking about some budget Yu-Gi-Oh decks you can win with. Seriously, huh? I've actually been doing a lot of digging and I found some really powerful budget decks that you can look into if you want a strategy that is pretty good and almost no chance of being hit by the forbidden list. Let's go ahead and jump on in. What's going on with ya, big dog? And it is an amazing day for Yu-Gi-Oh! I hope that your day phenomenal. But if it isn't, don't let what happened at the beginning of your day ruin the rest of your day. As you already know, for every single Monday, we gotta talk about a day for daddy! A particular time in the video where we talk about things to not only make you a better player, but to also make you a better player. Person. While I can't tell you guys every single thing just yet, I can tell you I've been going through a lot for the last month and a half. My car broke down, money issues, Ducky wants a $1 increase, he's sticking to that $10 and so many things in between. But one thing that I know that is for sure, something that has been keeping me going, is that if it wasn't meant for you, you were never meant to have it. This is a mentality that I've developed over the past month and a half, and basically it means if you lose something, it was never really yours. Think about it, big dog, everything happens for a reason, and you losing something can be an opportunity for you to prove yourself or make a situation even better. You just gotta accept that that wasn't meant for you and tap into something that is meant for you. And that's pretty much why we are talking about budget decks because the expensive stuff ain't meant for your broke ass. Don't worry, big dog, I'm broke too, so we had to save both. Today, we are going to be going over some of the most budget competitive Yu-Gi-Oh decks. Every single one of these strategies have either topped or won in the OTS championship this weekend or have done something significant inside of this new format. And as a special part of this video, when I can, not only am I going to give you guys a deck list of the people that won, I'll also be putting personal deck list on my Patreon as a special thank you to help me pay my editors. It'll also be even more budget because some of the staple cards that are being played inside of this deck may be a little bit expensive, but the deck itself is incredibly budget, so you're gonna have to like flip and work some things out. Kinda like how we make these the best thing in the world when we need them. Fun fact, noodles are amazing when you don't have to eat them every day. I think it's best to start off with the most surprising deck on this list, and it is Mimigul. Now, the reason why Mimigul is so surprising to me is because typically, when Konami makes a new archetype or a TCG exclusive, it's not necessarily that good. Guys, you gotta remember, Konami in America is the same Konami that gave us War Rocks. And I know how powerful War Rocks are, but in the grand scheme of things, they're not. Big dogs, in case you didn't know, every so often Konami gives us a TCG exclusive archetype, something that pretty much only comes out in North America and Europe. Konami has given us some complete duds when it comes to TCG exclusives like War Rock and Dream Mirror, but then they've also given us things like Burning Abyss and Plunder Patrol. And to keep it a being with you, most of the time, the archetypes aren't not necessarily that playable, so Mimigul being incredibly good is a change of pace. See, what makes Mimigul so good is its own gimmick, being able to give your opponent's monsters to the side of the field, especially when all of the Mimigul monsters are face up, they activate an effect that's detrimental to your opponent, and then they return back to your side of the field. Take for example, Mimigul Dragon forces your opponent to destroy all monsters on their side of the field, and Mimigul Archfiend allows the Mimigul player to be able to draw a card and forces the player that has this card to discard a card. This can be incredibly strong, especially seeing that those monsters are considered activated effects by your opponent. It means that you can trigger monster effects like Catch to a Unicorn and banish some of the most expensive cards out of your opponent's extra deck. So I see you playing that Fiendsmith engine. It'd be a shame if you lost Fiendsmith Tractus. And to double down on that, it also triggers the effect of the triple tactics cards as well as other catch tier monsters. This deck is actually pretty good and even got a top at the Halifax Regional by Todd Tolb. Now this particular deck does run cards like Triple Tactics Thrust and SP Little Knight, which is fairly expensive, but outside of that, I don't think that there's many cards in here over $10. In actuality, there are literally only four cards in here that are over $10. Everything else is pretty easy and accessible to get. And the best thing about Mimigul is that we've only had one wave of support. We are destined to get another wave of support when Rise of the Abyss comes out, and more than likely we'll get some extra cards down the line. This deck has so much potential and is already pretty 
decent right now. Now it's really weird that I'm talking about TCG exclusives because there is another TCG exclusive archetype that actually did get some support from Infinite Forbidden and has topped an OTS championship. In fact, it won it. Plunder Patrol as a deck type is incredibly cheap. I'm pretty sure you can get all of the cards that you absolutely need for Plunder Patrol in less than $20, giving you tons of room to be able to grow as a player and pick the cards that you need from there. But one of the unique things that Plunder Patrol has is that it can morph its monsters into extra deck monsters depending on the attribute your opponent has. Take for example, if you have Dark, you can get Morph to be able to banish cards on your opponent's side of the field. If your opponent has Light, you can get List to be able to negate monster effects. And if your opponent does have Fire, you can get Brawn to be able to get rid of your opponent's spell and trap cards. And every single one of these effects are actually pretty good and meta relevant. Take for example, getting dark and banishing your opponent's Ubel cards is crazy good. Sometimes being able to hit and banish the right card will prevent them from making Phantom of Ubel or even getting deep into their combo. Having light to be able to negate Fiendsmith cards like Fiendsmith Tractus or even the effect of Engraver of the Fiendsmith is also a huge W. And ironically enough, even in the fire matchup, this deck is a little bit more back row dependent than what some players will give it credit. Having Brawn to be able to get rid of Divine Temple or some of the cards that they put in the Spell and Trap card zone with Snake Eyes Populous is huge. And to add icing on the cake, your opponent doesn't necessarily have to make those cards on the field for you to be able to get them. Plunder Patrol actually has a ton of ways to get monsters of the attribute that they need to the side of the field to be able to get the monsters that they need. Take for example the new monster Dipsia Fiend, which is actually crazy for the deck. Dipsia Fiend is a TCG exclusive card that allows you to discard a card and declare an attribute and then special summon this card to either side of the field as that attribute. But then it also allows you to be able to special summon a fiend monster from your hand or graveyard too. So not only can it trigger the effects of Plunder Patrol Whitebeard, it can also bring out other Plunder Patrol monsters for you to be able to make some plays. Now, as far as the deck being pretty successful, here is a first place version of Chris's Plunder Patrol deck profile. Now, this was an OTS championship. Now, while I can't say how many people was there and what were the matchups, this was an OTS championship. An OTS champion Chips tend to bring out the best of the best. And I like how it's a Plunder Patrol Adventure Kaiju deck. A lot of people forget that the adventure cards can put a monster on the field that can negate spell traps and monsters, something that's highly coveted in Yu-Gi-Oh right now. But if there's one thing that I like seeing winning outside of TCG exclusives, it is 100% anime archetypes. I don't know about you guys, but I'm actually pretty excited that Yubel is one of the best decks, not only in Master Duel, but in the TCG, because at the end of the day, it is an anime archetype. And I think it's something that every Yu-Gi-Oh enthusiast that enjoyed the show will appreciate when the time comes. But if Ubel is one of the best decks in the game, then heroes will always have a chance. And I will stand 10 toes down on heroes having a chance. If you guys want to see a hero update, go ahead and let me know. I got the spice because this is actually a pretty good deck right now. What just about every Yu-Gi-Oh player focuses on is the bombs that heroes can make. And while I still think that Mass Hero Dark Law and Destiny Hero Plasma are really good Yu-Gi-Oh cards, especially seeing that everyone's complaining about cards like Dimension shifter in skill drain and those just so happen to be one-sided versions of those cards i think we sleep on some of the subtle things that hero can do that can actually make it a solid contender one of the biggest things is that destiny hero destroy your phoenix enforcer was never banned or hit in any way shape or form this card is a complete menace being able to consistently destroy cards on the field and himself being pretty immune to destruction seeing that he comes right back on the next turn is huge but i also think one of the other key components for heroes was Boarbaker cards being very accessible and also those same board breakers being incredibly effective in Yu-Gi-Oh. You see I've always said that heroes can't take that hand trap approach because it's too many cards. There's not enough room to be able to resolve polymerization if you're playing 14 to 20 million hand traps. But that's actually one of the best allures about heroes seeing that it allows you to be able to make your villainous board and then comes through with the heroes to save the day. It's easily one of the coolest things behind the deck. And Justin getting second place with heroes at an OTS championship is crazy. And no, guys, it wasn't my Justin. My Justin couldn't get second place. If the tournament consisted of just him and a chick, he'd get third. There's not too many things that's different from Justin's hero deck in other hero strategies. It's fairly standard. But it also goes to show that a standard build can still do well in today's Yu-Gi-Oh! format. Especially seeing that you have a one-sided skill drain and a one-sided macro cosmos, something that players absolutely hate right now. Right now.
I think that Heroes have put themselves in a prime spot to be one of the better budget decks, especially considering that there's only one expensive hero card. The other is getting reprinted inside of the Mega Tags. Now, I'm not even going to hold you. The last two slots is pretty much already a given. So I'm going to talk about them both together and give you a bonus strategy just for staying tuned for so long. The two strategies that I've decided to combine together actually got first and second place at the European Nationals. Ritual Beast and Tenpai Dragon are different decks, but almost the same thing. Ritual Beast on one side has a couple of expensive cards. Ritual Beast Elder Tamer and Spiritual Beast Tamer Laura are must-have Yu-Gi-Oh cards and unfortunately they're about $12 each and you can even go ahead and say that Arc Nemesis Protoss is another must-have Yu-Gi-Oh card it shuts out some of the best decks in the game completely this card is also about a $20 to $30 Yu-Gi-Oh card but outside of that the deck psh, it's literally pennies on the dollar despite having seven cards totaling close to about $100 the rest of the Ritual Beast strategy is incredibly cheap and seeing that the upcoming Mega Tens is a 400 card set we can even assume that ritual beast team or elder would be in there it only makes sense since Ritual Beast did get support. But the reasons why Ritual Beasts are so powerful is pretty simple. Despite the strategy being 10 years old, people still don't know how to play against it. It can play Dimension Shifter and Arc Nemesis Protoss, cards that can completely shut the opposing player out of the game. And while it is a complicated Yu-Gi-Oh deck, it is fairly rewarding. It's a decently strong Yu-Gi-Oh strategy with no natural weaknesses being played inside of the main board right now. This deck is pretty damn strong. Tenpai Dragon, on the other hand, and instead of focusing on shedding the opponent out like what Ritual Beast does with cards like Protoss and Dimension Shifter, Tempai Dragon just here for a good time, not a long time. It reminds me of every single one of our relationships. I be telling her, look, baby, you got five seconds with me. That's the best you get. Tempai Dragon is here to hit hard and fast. Holy crap, it's just like me. And while Trident Dragon and Tempai Dragon Pedra pretty much make up most of the entire deck, the rest of the cards are pretty much non-existent when it comes to price. It's kind of crazy that both Tempai Dragon and Ritual Beast probably should be running Dimension Shifter. Tempai Dragon is a deck that can do without it and can just win incredibly fast before your opponent can bat an eye. Now, as far as deck lists, I still think that it's best to use the European world championship decklist esteban Rees tenpai dragon deck may have a couple of expensive cards cards like mo chummy perelia and promethean princess are cards that you don't necessarily weed but are pretty expensive outside of that if you include trident dragon the entire deck is incredibly cheap still at least when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh's terms and julio vol's deck is a little bit more forgiving mo chummy perelia being the only real expensive card in here Outside of the cards that we've already talked about, I think personally, if you're getting into the game and you want to be as competitive as possible on a budget, these two are the ultimate decks for you to pick. And lastly, for the top five budget decks, I am going to make a copium pick. Now, I always love these type of picks because these are a pick that I genuinely think down in my heart are strong Yu-Gi-Oh decks. And if you guys have a copium pick, go ahead and let me know down below. But I genuinely think that ninjas can compete for what it costs. Big dog, let's face it. I don't think that there's gonna be anybody else that's gonna accomplish more than your boy did with ninjas. But overall for a deck that is main, extra, and side deck, $25? You kinda cook. Ninja just so happens to benefit in a format where board breakers are really good. And seeing that board breakers are decently well, especially cards like Book of Eclipse, ninjas can use that to not only slow down the opponent's tempo, they can also be tributed for your Nujitsu art card. Also, when played correctly, ninjas have some pretty cool combos. I mean, Yaga Amaru to be able to banish your opponent's cards, and Ninja Grandmaster Mazin can summon any ninja from your deck to your side of the field. My favorite is Geo to permanently flip your opponent's monsters face down. This deck actually does give a little bit of bang for its buck. And again, with an entire main board, extra deck, and sideboard, the whole shebang, 70 Yu-Gi-Oh cards being $20, there's almost no better bang for your buck. But go ahead and let me know if that one was cooking or copium, and what is your copium top budget meta Yu-Gi-Oh deck? I think that me and TJ are going to have to duke it out on the dual challenge, because while his Plunder Patrols did get a top, it wasn't him. I need him to stand no business and show me that ninjas ain't doing they thing. Until then, big dog, you can go ahead and check out these other videos so I can catch you on the next one.